Welcome to Literary Libations with Librarians. And this week we are going to be talking about great graphic novels. And I have to say I've seen the choices for this week and I'm pretty excited. I think I just find graphic novels as a genre format. Not sure which one it would be. I find them fascinating. As we're talking about these, if you'd like to get your hands on any of them, the first way to go about doing that would be to call your local branch of the Monroe County Library System and any of the staff would be happy to help you find a way to get these titles into your hands. If you prefer to do it on your own, if you're interested in a physical copy, a hardcover or a paperback, you can do those through our online catalog. The web address for that is on your screen currently. There are also some titles that are available digitally and as we talk about our titles, they'll appear on the screen as well as the various formats they're available in. We have two digital formats available through the Monroe County Library System. The first you may hear referred to as either Overdrive or as its app Libby. And so if you go into your app store, you can search for Libby and search for Overdrive if Libby, Libby doesn't appear. And Overdrive offers downloadable ebooks and downloadable audiobooks. And we also offer Hoopla. And Hoopla offers downloadable ebooks, audiobooks, and also movies, music, and graphic novels, which is fabulous. And the nice thing about Hoopla is that there is never a wait for any of the items that you see there. So you can go in and start downloading immediately. And with us this week is me, Jennifer Grineski, <laughs> the community librarian at the Dundee Branch Library. And our introductory question this week is, what was your favorite Sunday comic when you, or just comic strip? Because I don't know if I have some of you here that are too young to remember getting out the Sunday comic in color and reading it. Um, what was your favorite Sunday comic strip? And this was really hard, but I'm going to limit myself to one. But if nobody mentions my other one, then I'm going to circle back to me and share my second <laughs> one. But I went with The Far Side by Gary Larson. There is just something, and it, yeah, it's only a single panel, but that man could make you laugh at the absurdity of life and some really surreal moments with farm animals with a single panel. And so I just, I loved Gary Larson and The Far Side, particularly the one that's like on every coffee mug and t-shirt in the 90s, where it's the child going into the gifted school and the door clearly says pull and the child's pushing on the door. Yeah, been there, done that, had my moment. So Gary Larson, Fireside for me. We also have with us this week, Kristen Brown, who is a reference librarian at the Bedford branch. And what is your favorite comic strip, Kristen? Um, so this one was kind of tricky for me because I do know of comic strips in the paper, but we didn't really do that when I was younger. Um, and I probably should have done more research on this, but the first thing that came to my mind was Calvin and Hobbes. Does that count? Yes, that yeah. was, yeah, they okay. were in the paper. That was gonna be my second choice. Okay, I, Calvin, yeah, and Hobbes. Calvin and Hobbes all day long. In fact, I had a couple books um, from that artist, so, which I, which is why I said I should do more research because I don't know who did it. Uh, I just Bill thought it was Water, Waterston, Waterston, I yeah, he is super interesting. See, I can be real nerdy right now and talk about him and his fights with like newspaper syndicates and trying to get it like bigger in the paper, but I won't do that. I'll control myself. <laughs> Two thumbs up to Calvin and Hobbes. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Kristen. Also with us, we have Jen McCarty, a reference librarian at the Ellis branch. And what is your favorite comic strip, Jen? So going back, I, I thought of Farside, I thought of Calvin and Hobbes, I thought of classic Peanuts, um, but I always really liked Kathy, which is funny because like right. as a kid, like <laughs> Kathy's about a businesswoman, you know, like living her life. And I don't know why that appealed to me because obviously I couldn't relate to it in any way, but I always really liked that. Um, and like current comics, web comics, got to give a shout out. I love Lunar Baboon. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that one. Um, but it's the the creator of it is actually a teacher and he suffers with a lot of like um, anxiety and depression and a lot of his comic or a lot of his little strips have a lot to do with that, but they're really, really wholesome. So if you've never heard of Lunar Baboon, check him out. Um, 
that's my like current favorite. But back to the Saturday Sunday mornings. Yeah, I loved Kathy. <laughs> Which makes me laugh because I remember reading Kathy too, and it's like her woes as like not being able to yeah. find love. Ex. You know, here's <laughs> ten year old me, like I feel you, Kathy. <laughs> I gotcha. Gonna go eat a pan of brownies now because yeah. Kathy does it. <laughs> so, yeah, good times. Thank you, Jen. Also with us, we have Jody Russ, the community librarian at the Bedford Branch. And what was your favorite, or is your favorite comic strip, Jody? You guys make me feel very old, so let me just say that first. Um, and I have to give a shout out to like my lifelong favorite because it started when I was in middle school, which is going to give you guys an ind indication uh, would be Garfield um, because you know Garfield has a middle school mentality, I think, and it really kind of fits well. I still have a Garfield calendar. My mother-in-law buys me a Garfield calendar every year for Christmas, still hangs on my wall in my kitchen. So um, big fan of Garfield. However, I'd have to say honestly when I was a kid, um, because again Garfield came out when I was in middle school, um, as did Reese's peanut butter cups and Mountain Dew probably. So um, <laughs> I would have to say when I was a kid, I really liked The Wizard of Id. Mm. Huh. Oh, see, I don't, I don't know. know that one. This is a little it, intellectual. See, I'm old. I, no, was, no, I know The Wizard of Id. That's not saying and that I like, lot, I, don't I like Hagar the Horrible, too, actually. Oh, yes. For some oh, reason, yeah. Hagar, was on my list. you know, kind of cracked me up. I would say right now the, oh, and now I don't remember the name of it. Shouldn't even mention it. But the one about the fan, it's different. It always has a mom and a teenage son in it, and he always, his room's always a mess and what. A, Anyway, it's very much like the life of my oldest son and me, so now I can't even <laughs> remember the name of it. That one sounds familiar. I feel like I do know that one. Yeah, I'll come up I with it. It's, it's not for better or worse, is it? Yeah, maybe for better or worse. Maybe that's it. Because I like for better or worse because like the kids actually grew mm -hmm. in the comic strip. Like they started young and then they did turn into teenagers and everything. <laughs> Thank you, Jody. And we also have with us this week Kelly Venier, the branch technician at the South Rockwood Library. And what is your favorite comic strip, Kelly? Um, well, really quick, I just want to comment, Jody. So my kids are um, seven and nine, and they are obsessed with Garfield. And he has his own show on Netflix. My and kids also all watch that day. Garfield show, uh, and they're five and three. So it boggles <laughs> my like, you, you guys, like, of all the things, they, they like, it's. It's Super Mario, watching people play Super Mario video games, which I don't get that either. And Garfield. I don't. <laughs> and Garfield, he's so... always so monotone. Like, he's just like, okay. And I'm like, what? I don't understand. Well, the, I haven't seen the new Netflix series, but the guy who used to play Carlton was, or used to play Garfield was Carlton the doorman from the show Rhoda, which was a spinoff of the Mary Tyler yeah, Moore Mary show. Mary Tyler Moore show, yeah. None of you guys remember either, probably. <laughs> I knew I knew who the show was. I've seen the Mary the Tyler Moore man. show, and I've heard of Rhoda. Yeah. Hi, this is Carlton, the doorman. He's always buzzing in. That was the voice of Garfield from back in the day. <laughs> Oscar. <laughs> Somebody's kitty um, was making an appearance. Yeah, I know. He was like peekaboo. Um, so my favorite Sunday comic, and so Kristen, I'm surprised you don't remember, like, Grandpa, like up at the trailer, Grandma and Grandpa used to get the Sunday paper, and that was always fun going through the, the Sunday comics, and then Mom and Dad got it later. But my favorite was Sunday Circus. I always got a kick out of that catastrophe. Mm -hmm. There was always something crazy going on there, and so I always liked them. Um, and, and then, you know, who doesn't love Dennis the Menace? Oh, yeah. Oh, that was yeah. A good I do know yeah. that one. Those were the first two that I always went for in, in the paper. So, and they're still, you know, they're still they're still really good. Still pretty, pretty good. <laughs> And just one final shout out when Jen mentioned web comics, I'm just going to shout out for Strange Planet. Yes. Oh, yeah. I L P Y L E Strange Planet. We also have at yes. least one of his books in the library system. Yep. He does have two, but yeah. I don't know what the second one is in the system. But we yeah, have Strange it. Planet. I'm so beat. glad you did a shout out because I completely forgot about him and he's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, when you said good. Lunar Baboon, it, but the way you described it made me think of Strange Planet, too, because completely yep, yeah. family friendly, yep. very funny. So Hilarious. sometimes warms your heart, sometimes makes you go, yep, that's my life. I feel like it's <laughs> my mission to just show people Strange Planet so I can be like, look, look how relatable this is. And, and it's some hilarious. People get, and some people don't. Some people are like, I don't, I don't, I don't compute. But then other people are like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> I'm on the amazing side. Yeah, me, me too. Me as well. All right, so now we're going to jump into our graphic novel discussion. 
And let's have let's have Kristen get us started. OK, so um, my two choices, one choice I've um, known about for a really long time. I had it introduced to me when I was in high school and it's just kind of stuck with me. The other one I actually found while doing research for this topic because I was like, ooh, graphic novels. I'm not super familiar with this. Um, let's just kind of see what ones there are. And that's why I love doing this program. I love liter literary libations because nine times out of 10, it kind of pushes me to try new things and read new books. Um, so the first one I'm going to start with is Hey Kiddo, and it's by Jarrett Krasowska. I should, I always remember it because there's a part in this book where his grandfather jokes with him about how they were going to name him Oscar and that is like rhymed with his last name. So they were like, oh, that would be funny. So I think it's Krasowska, Oscar, Chris, I don't know. Um, but so the title is Hey Kiddo, How I Lost My Mother, Found My Father and Dealt With Family Addiction. And so when I originally picked this, I was like, this is going to be a real heavy book. I don't know, but it's graphic novel. I'm really interested to see the artwork. Um, the cover of it has this young guy on it. And so I just thought, you know what, let's check this out. So um, it is a biography of the artist and how he deals with his life over time. And so in the beginning, you learn that um, Jared's mother, Leslie, um, gets pregnant with him really early in life. She's like 16. And from there, it's kind of a downhill for her. She's um, a user, so she's addicted to uh, narcotics and she's in and out of jail. So she's not really present in Jared's life. When he's three years old, he goes to live with his grandparents, um, Shirley and Joe. And Shirley and Joe are really amazing people. Joe is super kind hearted and he is uh, the parent that just wants Leslie to get better. So he keeps um, almost enabling her, but like he he buys her a house so that her and Jared can live together, but they're close. And, you know, once she continues to use is when they end up getting custody. Shirley and Leslie have a really hard relationship. Um, Shirley drinks um, and when she drinks, she gets really violent and really angry, um, which leads me to believe that Leslie kind of um, dealt with that situation by turning to drugs. Um, but his grandparents take him in and they take amazing care of him. He has a really hard time understanding what's happening with his mother. And the um, shot that you see now is the part where Shirley and Joe tell him, you know, you're going to be staying with us. And he doesn't really understand. He just wants his mom. So as time goes on, um, him and his mother have correspondence while she's in jail and they draw pictures back and forth. And he really um, gets this beautiful relationship with art. He develops it because of him and his mother drawing pictures. His grandparents see that and they ask him if he wants to take lessons at a local art museum. And this kind of um, sets in motion his, his love and his want of a career to do art, and he ends up turning to comics, which is what he's really interested in. Um, and so his grandparents buy him this draft table. He takes these lessons at the museum, and he um, is really influenced by the instructor at the museum. There's a part in the book where he buys this uh, how to draw comics like a Marvel artist and his instructor set, tells him forget everything you learned in that book like you already have a style you don't need to to draw like anybody else forget everything you learned which I think being a former art teacher and, and teaching kids about art like I was like yes good for you like that's so awesome um and he gets a new neighbor he ends up meeting his best friend Pat and you learn later on in life that him and Pat stay friends they're still friends today um Leslie is in and out of his life and unfortunately every time she comes back into his life she's buying him things and she's giving him a birthday party at McDonald's even though it's not really his birthday and he ends up kind of realizing that when she's here she's just giving him things and that she can't really give him his time and as he grows into a teenager he starts to get kind of angry at their relationship. Um, there is a really pivotal moment for him, which I was like, this is amazing. Jack Gantos, who is a children's author who, right, like I knew Kelly, you'd be super excited about this. Um, he visits his school and he does an assembly and it's when uh, he was just doing the series Rotten Ralph. He ends up coming to Jarrett's classroom after the assembly and comments on Jarrett's cat, which is like a profound 
thing for him. Um, and so I thought that was really cool because I'm a big fan of Jack Antos as an author as well. Um, he has to go to a new school and at that new school, he becomes the uh, cartoonist for his newspaper. And so that's a really great part in his life. So not to give all the details of the book, it's just, it's a really great novel because all of the characters, I feel like were part of my family even though it's not my family but you just you get to know joe and shirley and leslie his mom and at the end of the book he he ends up finding his father who he has no contact with since day one um and he meets his father he finds out that he has some siblings and so he's able to create this really beautiful relationship with his father and he still has a really beautiful relationship with his mother even though his mother was gone like she didn't even come to his high school graduation she was really dodgy even when she got out of jail but he was able to see that her addiction really was an illness and that even though she wasn't there regardless of everything, she continually told him, I love you. I just want what's best for you. And so he was able to still have a really beautiful relationship with his mother also. Um, and I, there were times where I was like crying and I was super happy, which is, you know, a graphic novel. It didn't take me very long to read this. I read it in an afternoon. I probably read it in like an hour, maybe less because I just sat down and read the whole thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. And I think it is so relatable. Um, the ages for it are 12th grade. Um, there is a lot of profanity in it. Shirley has a potty mouth, which is kind of endearing for her. Cause she's just, I don't know, I, it fits for her. I, I enjoyed it. It was a really beautiful, beautiful book. I highly, highly recommend it. If you have anybody in your family who is dealing with addiction, I think it's a great book for reflection. And if you don't, I think it's just a great book to get some insight. Um, and then of course, just a little thing, the, uh, the artist in me was like, oh, this is fantastic. Because at the end, he also talks about um, the, the kind of style that he specifically chose for this book. This is his first, as far as I know, uh, kind of adult novel. All of his other books are kid books. And so he really um, took the time to to make the artwork look a specific way. So he said he wanted to look, he wanted it to look like memories uh, when you're reading it. The second one I'm going to talk about is Goodbye Chunky Rice by uh, Craig Thompson. And this book is um, completely different than Hey Kiddo. The storyline is, it's not super strong. There isn't like a, a big beginning, middle, and end. Chunky Rice is a, a cute little turtle, and he has his friend Dandel, and they they have this great life together. They hang out all the time. Chunky Rice realizes that he wants to go and discover other things. He wants to travel to other places. And although Dandel is super sad about it, um, she tells him, you, you've kind of outgrown this place. You do. You need to go travel and find things. Um, Dandel, or Chunky Rice, lives in the same building from what I know um, as this man, Solomon, who is a really, he's kind of naive. And I feel like the author depicts him as somewhat lower on the cognitive level, but he's super friendly and he's super chatty and very wholesome. And um, he ends up carrying Chunky Rice's stuff to his boat and the boat is being captained by Solomon's brother, Chuck. Um, and you end up finding that Solomon and Chuck have kind of a tricky history because of something that happened with their father. And so they're not really on speaking terms. And um, it was something that Solomon's father told him to do. And at the time, I don't think Solomon really understood what was happening. And so it caused some bad feelings between them. Um, the Captain Chuck is really strange. He strikes me as somebody who I would not necessarily trust, but he's not necessarily a bad person. I don't know. My first expression, my first um, introduction with him um, in the book is that he takes all of Chunky Rice's stuff out of his suitcase and tells him, hey, you can't take that on my boat. We'll capsize. It's too much. And then he's like, oh, well, this is a real nice uh, flower vase you got here. My wife would really like that. And, oh, you have these records, Motown records. We don't want these. So he like throws them in the water. Um, and so Chuck is a little bit interesting. Um, on board that ship, so Chuck is the captain. Chunky Rice is on the ship now. There are a set of conjoined twins, um, Livonia and Ruth. And they're also like just really interesting, odd characters that 
are nice and friendly in their own way, but they're also really quirky and strange. And that's what I love about this graphic novel because the whole premise is Chucky Rice gets on this boat and there's not really an ending to it. Like him and Dandel don't really come back together that we know of. Craig Thompson leaves it really up to the reader, but you have all these side characters that are just really, they enrich the story. And so you get to know these weird quirky people and how they are in uh, Chunky Rice's life now. So while Chunky Rice is gone, Dandel starts writing letters to him in bottles and putting them in the ocean. And we don't know if Chunky Rice ever gets these. Um, and there's one really great part where, um, you know, after Chunky Rice gets all of his Motown records thrown in the ocean, uh, the radio comes on the boat and it's a Motown song and he starts dancing around and everybody's really happy for a second. And so that's a really great part that I like. Um, so it's just a really simple, beautiful comic book. It really talks about emotion, losing things. Um, there's a really couple sad parts with Solomon. Um, there's so the situation that happened with him and his father, his father um, told him to drown all the puppies because the dog had too many puppies. And so he said, he can't feed all these puppies. You need to go take them in the water. And Solomon didn't really know what his father was asking him to do. And so he's scarred for life from this. He keeps having flashbacks of that as incident. And there's also a time where Solomon is playing hide and seek with other kids and the kids end up running away and leaving him. And so it's just, it's this, weird tragic emotional thing with all these different characters and so it's beautiful but it's also very sad at some parts and um so it's just a weird quirky comic <laughs> graphic novel um so i had yeah like i said i got introduced uh to this when i was in high school so ron if you ever watch this thanks for introducing me to chunky rice um because 13 years later i'm talking about it <laughs> so so if uh, if you're looking for a quick read that's kind of emotional but also very happy, Chunky Rice is your goodbye. Chunky Rice is your choice. And Craig Thompson also wrote Blankets. Blankets. And yeah, Blankets is one of the iconic works in the graphic novel oeuvre. Yeah. Um, and I have read that one. I have not read Chunky Rice, um, but I have read Blankets, and it's it's really well done about first love and faith and disappointing your family and confusion and it's about older teens um from what i understand good. blankets was so well received but goodbye chunky rice i feel like people were either really taken by it and really enjoyed it or they were like i don't understand what this is about like, well, I think it's so different just from what you're describing because Blankets is very um, contemporary, very realistic, right. and Chunky Rice sounds quite different. <laughs> so it might just be like if they went in thinking, I'm going to get another Blankets, and this author and artist said, no, I, I've got a different story to tell, and they yeah. weren't ready for that. Yeah. So, And also, I want to second Kristen's recommendation for Hey Kiddo. It is amazing. It's it is. I think I'm going to buy a copy just for me. And also, Jarrett, as a person, he's got a great TED Talk. As a person, I just was like, oh, you are so amazing. So definitely check him out. Check that book out. Super good. Thank you, Kristen. And now let's have Jody share her graphic novel choices. Um, Kristen's always such a hard act to follow up. So the first thing I'm going to say is I don't read graphic novels. I've read very few graphic novels, I think, for like a collection development class and, a, you know, early childhood education kind of thing. I had to read one, but I uh, uh, generally don't pick them up. So um, just being inspired to get on literary libations this week, I went ahead and committed myself and I ended up finding a couple. Um, so I hope I don't offend graphic novel lover lovers. That's what I wanted to say about that. Um, <laughs> because, you know, I just don't know that much, but I went ahead and I found a couple of books that are in our system that are on timely topics and that wasn't necessarily my um, that that wasn't necessarily what I was looking for. Part of what I was looking for is we have graphic novels on so many different topics and I was thinking of all the historical things that have been covered. Like for instance, I picked up Diary of Anne Frank in a graphic novel version. There's, there's a book on the Titanic sinking. There's a book on 
all kinds of different pivotal historical mo moments in our history um, that are turned into graphic novels. And so I guess I just wanted to, for one, give a shout out to those because, you know, if you struggle to read or aren't interested in reading or, um, you know, just prefer that visual kind of stimulation when you are reading, those are great ways to get the facts about something that you might have to know more about, but um, don't necessarily want to read one of those more lengthy books. Um, we didn't have any of those on the shelf when I, except the Anne Frank one um, here at my branch um, when I went to look for these. So what I ended up picking up um, was two completely different stories, but very, very timely. So the first one is called A Fire Story by Brian Feiss, and it's about the California wildfires. And so these are the wildfires that raged through in 2017. Um, and then the other one is called Drawing the Vote, and it's all about the history of voting. And so I'll go back to A Fire Story and talk about that one a little bit. Um, so this was in 2000, October 2017, Northern California um, had 8,900 structures were burned, 6,200 homes were destroyed, 44 people lost their lives. One of those homes belonged to Brian Feiss, and so he was he he woke up at he and his wife woke up at 1:30 in the morning. Both of them instantly woke up. She woke up because the power went out. He woke up because he smelled smoke. Um, they looked out their window and could see the glow and the interesting, so a couple of things that I found really interesting about this story is first of all, the pictures really help you feel. You can see the page that I selected right there. This is after the fires were over and he walked back into the, the fire zone and that's his neighborhood on the right. Everything was gone, everything was gone. Cars were melted. Um, it's really, it was really pretty amazing to see those pictures. And because it's a graphic depiction of this, like that's the kind, I was thinking if I had just been reading the words, I wouldn't have really been able to feel what he was trying to get across to people. And so I feel like in this particular instance, a graphic novel setting is so very good for this. Um, so what he ended up doing because he already was a, a author and illustrator um he put together a first hand account in just an online comic shortly after this happened but then afterwards he decided he needed to tell more of the story and so he wrote this book um, as a full length graphic novel and it includes environmental insight about the California wildfires and stories of others that were affected by the disaster. And so he tells his own story, but then he also has multiple pages in the book dedicated to other people who went through the fire and what their stories were. And the thing that I found really interesting um, is that they all talk about the things that they decided to take with them and how those things really made no sense afterwards. Um, although he managed to grab all of his, like he managed to grab his flash drives that had all of his books. He managed to grab a copy of every single book that he had written, um, but not all of them. Um, but then, you know, things like he didn't grab the videotapes of their daughters growing up. And so when they realized later that they didn't have those, it was pretty traumatic. And his wife worked for the emergency management division in the area. And so she had to go immediately from her own neighborhood burning down to emergency mode. Um, she had 19 people on her staff and only two of them showed up because everybody else had already lost everything in the fire. And so they're talking about how you know, she spent days without ever leaving her office. She spent days and days there trying to help people get the resources that they needed. And then and then it kind of hit her suddenly, hey, I'm one of the people that needs these resources. And so because this is still going on currently right now, wildfires destroying so much of California, even more than they did in 2017. Um, I thought it was a really interesting way to understand more about what was going on out there. I will say there is language in this book. I mean, I guess I would be swearing too if I walked back into my neighborhood and saw everything gone, right?
So, um, so it's not for younger kids, but I, you know, high school kids, there's not a lot of language. It's just like his initial reaction when he sees everything burned. Um, and, you know, he tells about how he tried to help neighbors get out and all kinds of other things. So it's pretty amazing. But um, anyway, I would, rec I, I mean, I would recommend it as a way to understand part of what's happening out there and a way to, to fully, you know, more fully feel what they're actually going through. So um, it was definitely really interesting. Uh, and my second title, Drawing the Vote by Tommy Jenkins. So Tommy Jenkins is a um, professor at a college in uh, North Carolina, and he teaches incoming freshmen mostly. And so he said that he was always taught by his parents. He's, he has always voted um, because he was taught by his parents how important it was, and he just did it because they wanted him to do it. And it took a lot of time for him to understand more about how important voting is. And so in the first chapter of this book, he talks about um, our most recent presidential election and and then the um, midterm elections and how excited as a country we were that 49% of the people got out and voted in the midterms. But it's still less than half, right? And so he said he has always asked his freshman class of students, are you going to vote whenever there's a, an election coming up? Are you going to vote? And, you know, show of hands and discussion about elections. And he said, you know, in 2008, everybody was excited and people were really motivated and everything else. But then in um, in the 2000 16 election, I guess several people were voting in the 2016, but then in the 2018 midterms, the response was more like, why should I bother? Because my my vote doesn't matter anyway. And so he feels it's really, really important that he, I think he really strongly feels that more people would get out and vote if they understood the history that our country has gone through to create the opportunity for everybody to vote in the first place and what the history of that is um, and to try to develop an appreciation for what that struggle has been like for uh, for the country as a whole, not even just any particular, obviously for particular groups as well, but just for the country as a whole to establish what we have as American citizens and um, not only our right, but our responsibility to vote. And so he decided to do this book as a graphic comic strip style because he's hoping that more young adults will pick up something like that and learn more about the history of voting and then therefore it would lead to them feeling more inspired to do so. So <clears throat> I think, I mean, it seems like a great, I, I'll be honest and say I haven't finished it. This one is in Hoopla, so I'm reading it on my phone, which has been really interesting. Um, I haven't finished the book yet though, so I don't know. So far, I mean, for the parts that I've been through, there's no language, there's no, I mean, I think it would be appropriate for high school students for sure, and definitely for college students. That's really who he wrote it for because he's trying to inspire them to get out and be, um, be more active in, our decisions in the country. So, thank you, Jody. Jody. Sure, those are some those great, great choices. choices. Holy moly! Getting a little bit of an echo, but um, the yeah. fire one in particular, the line that was on the screen where it said, "I inhaled my neighbors' lives." I was. I can't even imagine looking at that sort of loss and devastation. So we just watched the other night, um, Only the Brave. Have you guys seen that movie? OK, it's it's very interesting being engaged to a firefighter. I've never knew so much about fire until now. And then he makes me watch these super sad movies, which I don't understand, but it was really, really good. So it's about the story of these um, local firefighters who um, are the first ever to become hot shots, which is like a federal funded um, fire protection. And they they 
take out these wildflower fires and stuff. And it baffled my mind how they fight these wild. They the term "fight fire with fire" is le legit from like these firefighters fighting wildfires. Like they they like dig a trench and then they put small fires to mm -hmm. disengage the bigger ones. Blew my mind. I had no idea. Only the brave you should see. It's based on real like real life things. My, We're gonna uh, have a box of tissues, but it's super good. My cousin's husband, um, they live in California and he's on the wildfire team out there. And it's it's amazing to me, you know, every year, like seeing how early, like it's earlier and earlier. OK, Josh is gone now um, and they'll maybe drive up to the fire areas and see him for like a day and then they have to go home and yeah, they're gone all the they're time. They're gone. They're gone yeah. like for months at a time and he loves it, but it's, you know, it's crazy. Like. Wow. And dangerous, obviously. It's kind of yeah. scary. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Scary. I, I meant to mention too, one of the stories talked about um, an elderly woman who lived in a mobile home park that was right next to a hospital there. And she said, um, when I was mentioning the weird stuff that people chose to take and the stuff that they didn't choose to take, she grabbed a bunch of history of her life kind of thing. She was smart enough to grab her insurance papers and her documentation for everything. But she also grabbed, her husband had recently passed away. And so she also grabbed things that meant a lot to her because of that, she didn't take any clothes with her. So like, it's kind of interesting what people choose to take and don't choose to take. So in some of the stories it was, I forgot to bring this and I really wish I had that, but I didn't think to take, you know. Yeah. Um, so it was just really interesting. And in her case, her mobile home was still standing because it was right by the the mobile home park was right next to the hospital and the firefighters did everything they could to save the hospital and in doing so save they soaked home this home. whole row of the mobile home park so there were 44 trailers in the mobile home park and all but like eight of them were gone because they had burned but these eight that were right next to the hospital were saved however it's still destroyed because it got so wet, right? But because it's still standing, her insurance won't cover anything. So she's <sighs> in this never ending battle of <sighs> she still doesn't have a place to live, but nobody will help her out. Oh so, um, and still, I mean, this book was published in 2019. So it was two years after these particular fires, um, still fighting that fight. So it's just, it's so devastating and we oh totally don't understand it because we live here where we're not really dealing with right. it. Right? So. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you, Jody. Those are both good titles, both very timely. Mm -hmm. Both there. That's my that's my word as a librarian. <laughs> Wherever yep. you stand, just go. Yep. Home. All right, let's have Jen share her graphic novels with us. Half of your titles, kind of. <laughs> um, so my two that I chose are Jim Butcher's um, graphic novelization of the first Dresden Files, um, and Black Canary Black Canary Ignite by Meg Cabot. So let's start with with um, let's start with Jim, with uh, Dresden. So this is um, Stormfront uh, Volume One: The Gathering Storm is the full title. And it is a graphic novelization of the popular Dresden Files. I've talked about Dresden before. It's one of my favorite series. Um, I've actually been rereading them and I'm up to book like 13, I think. Um, the most recent book came out and I decided I needed to reread them all before I got to it. So that's been my goal for the last couple of months. Um, and I, I love them. I love them. So it's happy. Um, so the Dresden Files, this covers the first half of the first book. So if you're not familiar with Dresden, he is a wizard. Um, he's a wizard for hire. He's basically kind of like a PI. Um, and I enjoyed as much as I've loved the books. The graphic novel is kind of fun because you get, you know, actual imagery of some of these people um, on the picture that's on your screen right now. The character with the sword, his name is Donald Morgan. And he is a warden of the White Council, which basically means he's like a wizard cop. And Dresden has done some stuff in his past, and um, Donald does not trust him at all. And so he's basically kind of following him around in the beginning of the story, looking for reasons to prove that he's still a bad guy. Um, and then you also have one of my favorite characters in the whole series, Bob the Skull. He shows up there and I love being able to just actually see Bob because I don't picture him that like I obviously know <laughs> the skull. Um, he's basically a spirit of intellect that lives inside this 
skull. And so he's kind of like um, Dresden's like magical tutor in some ways. He knows, you know, thousands of years of magic and he can kind of help him do things. Um, but he's also a really funny character in that he's basically a spirit. He's a spirit of intellect. He lives inside of a skull, which is entertaining. Um, but he, like, he helps Dresden, like, do potions and stuff. And he's, he is obsessed with romance novels. And um, <laughs> this skull funny. sounds funny. Yeah, he's a little, <laughs> he's a little, he's a little pervy. He's a little inappropriate. Like, and so in this panel, he's trying to convince him to make a love potion. And Dresden has no interest in that whatsoever. But of course he does it. And things go wrong with that, which are entertaining. Um, but I really enjoy this book. It covers about the first half of the first novel. So if you've read the Dresden Files, it's nothing new. There are a couple of standalones. There's one called Welcome to the Jungle that takes place before this. Um, it's not duplicated in just the standard print anywhere, but this one is basically a retelling of the first book. But it's fun to see um, kind of how he I don't know, it's, it's just seeing the actual visual representation of these characters that like I've been spending an insane amount of time with. Um, in the first book, there is what he refers to as a like a toad monster. And it's kind of funny because I don't know if we can see it. I, I should have shared this one. Um, I didn't picture it like this at all. But then like when I'm reading through this, I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's exactly how we described it. That's not how I pictured it, but that works. Um, it's just fun. It's just fun to see this kind of dark noir-esque character. He's a PI, but there's also magic. Um, it's it's definitely a fun read and it's a good introduction to the books. Like if you're not really sure, hey, do I want to read, you know, do I want to dedicate a ton of time to reading all the Dresden files? Well, hey, you can do it in graphic novel form and it's going to go by a lot quicker. <laughs> um, my other book is Black Canary Ignite and it's by one of my favorite authors, Meg Cabot. This is her first graphic novel that she did with um, Kara McGee as the illustrator. And it's a updated telling of Black Canary, who's a DC superhero. So in this version, um, the main character's name is Dinah, and she's a middle schooler. Like her big concern is she wants to win the Battle of the Bands with her best friends. She also wants to join the Junior Police League and her dad, who's a cop, is like, oh, no, we live in we live in Gotham City. It's not real safe. You're not going to do this. Um, and as the book goes on, she discovers that her mom was the original Black Canary and has sort of hung up her mantle as the Black Canary superhero. Um, she got married to her dad, obviously, and they're, you know, trying to um, shelter Dinah from this a lot. But uh, Dinah might have inherited her mom's superhero superpower. So there's a bad guy um, or a bad girl, actually, Bonfire, who is coming after both Black Canaries now because Dinah has taken over this mantle from her mom. They both have the superpower. She kind of wants to get them both. This is super fun. Um, total girl power, total mother daughter, you know, whatnots. There's a little bit of the family relationship. Dad doesn't want her to be, you know, doing anything dangerous. Um, but she's like, uh, you met mom because she's a superhero. Hello, how can you tell me I can't do anything dangerous? I think like middle school age girls, especially, I would love this. Obviously, it's superheroes, but it's it's got a lot of girl power. You know, she's an all girl rock band. Um, her mom is a superhero. She's gonna take over this mantle. Really, really cute. Um, I read it in probably half an hour. Not a thick book. Not a complicated book by any man. You know, by any means, but definitely super, super cute. A fun introduction to a DC superhero that I had never heard of before reading this. I um, mean, the art is really cute too. So it's definitely a really, really fun read. And um, if you know any like middle school age girls, perfect, perfect. Nice. Thanks, Jen. Those both sound fun. So after you read the serious ones, then you can go pick up a fun one. Exactly, read some enter just pure entertainment. I love that there's so there's such a wide variety though. One of the things that I had a really hard time doing was not picking some of those books that Jody had mentioned that um, are historical ones, but are also kind of classics for graphic novels like Mouse by Art Spiegelman, um, Persepolis, and I'm not going to remember 
the author's name. I almost did Persepolis, and then I was like, hold up, let's wait. So and I was I glad that you chose a superhero exactly. one because we didn't have any others. And I, I I've been debating born, about yeah. Watchmen because that's kind of one of the early, hey, Sand, superheroes Sandman are great, right but they're right up also there for me. I considered Sandman and was like, yeah. oh, man. I was going to do The Witcher, but then I was like, uh, I feel like that's a cop out because I feel I like also, Witcher fans, like if you go right to the comic and you didn't yeah. read the books and you don't know about the video games, you should probably stop talking. <laughs> I also wanted to do like there's, um, like Jody was saying, there's also a bunch of like classics. So like there's Shakespeare. Which, yeah, graphic novel is the perfect form for that. Yeah, graphic yeah. novels. There's something for everyone yeah. in graphic novels. You love knitting? There's probably a graphic novel. Zombies? There's probably a thousand graphic <laughs> novels <laughs> with zombies. Zombies knitting? Let me do some research. I bet you it's out there. It could be a thing. Thank you, Jen. All right, Kelly, go ahead and share your graphic novels. Well, mine, um, are you know I'll start with the good one first because I have a real light-hearted kids really nice one and then I have a real like whoa all right well that's intense so the first one um, I'll start with is El Duffo by C.C. Bell um, it's a memoir um, told in graphic novel format and um, I love this graphic novel and it's one of my favorite um, graphic novels to introduce to kids to get them kind of the idea of it it's um, the story of Cece Bell, when she is four years old, she um, contracts meningitis and she becomes deaf. And so she goes to a special school for hearing impaired children. And um, the book starts with that little backstory, but it really starts her first day of school in first grade because she's now in a school with kids who all have their hearing. There's not a separate class for the kids who are hearing impaired. And it's the 70s. So she has a fanatic ear, which is a huge box on her chest and then she has the earphones that go in her ear. What I love about this book and why I think it's so great for kids is the illustration. She uses um, rabbits to tell her story. Um, and I always ask the kids like, why Why do you think that she used rabbits? And it takes them a little while, but then they're like, oh, because of the big ears. They have the long ears, so it's, it's obvious, right? So she obviously is gonna struggle um, with her, um, with her, obstacle with her challenge of, of being hearing impaired. She's in first grade. She's with these kids who don't have this thing. And, um, you know, she kind of convinces herself, well, like, this is kind of a cool thing. Like, I'm kind of like a superhero because I can hear all the things. And I have this really cool thing. Um, and she can hear the teacher. So it, the teachers have a separate mechanism that they speak into for her to hear better. Well, they don't take that mechanism off when they leave the classroom. So she can hear the teachers literally everywhere. The teacher's lounge complaining about other teachers because in the 70s, you could go to the teacher's lounge and smoke a cigarette while your kids are doing work. She could hear the teachers in the bathroom, use the bathroom. And so she kind of uses that as a platform um, more so later on, like in, in her older grades um, to, to kind of like get people in and, and know that. But, you know, as the story progresses, she realizes like, yeah, superheroes are really cool, but they're also very different. And sometimes being different can feel very alone. And so she really struggles to find a friend who isn't bossy, who isn't judgmental. Um, and, and the story is just so sweet. Um, she does a lot. CC Bell does a lot of um, interviews about the story. So I highly recommend going and listening to some of those and just listening to her story outside of the graphic novel because I love graphic novels. Like I love being stimulated by the illustrations and seeing like, um, you know, especially the remakes like Harry Potter, how you would inter interpret that or or like Jen said, the Dresden Files. So like, um, but hearing the separate story, you can't put everything into a graphic novel, right? You can't be so detailed. Um, so hearing her story is really great. And you guys, I love when authors fall in love with each other and they become married. And so guess who she's married to? I just found this out today. Tom Engelberger. He wrote um, Origami Yoda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I was Oh my God, that makes me so happy because I love her and I love him. And I love when there's like a magic love story like that. So that made my that made my day. So Origami Yoda, if you haven't read him, you should read you should read that too. Um, so yeah, definitely um, a great a great way to introduce kids to um, nonfiction, memoirs, and then graphic novels. One of the things too that I like in here that she really highlights is the different um, ways of of narration in the graphic novel right like she does a really good job of the thought bubbles and what the characters talk or those are the, the characters conversing versus just the narrative at the top and so that's another thing that i think is great about that book um for people for kids who are, are just starting out um in that genre 
All right, are you guys ready for for the next one? This this is gonna get it's gonna get deep. Just kidding, it's just creepy. <laughs> um, my friend Dahmer is the next I'm gonna write or read or talk about. Um, it's by Ber Dirk Backdurf, and um, so I am gonna tell a little bit of a backstory about this first. So I wasn't a huge graphic novel or comic reader. I read the comics on, in the Sunday paper, but this this graphic novel really turned me on to all graphic novels. Um, so Durf Back Durf is a um, author from Ohio. He went to high school with Jeffrey Dahmer and the book, it's just so, it's, it's just so fascinating. First of all, listening to him on the panel that I went to for a conference, um, I found my love of serial killers during this time too. I find them so fascinating. I think the lack of empathy and just I, I, I don't know. There's just something about them that I find fascinating. And so this was kind of a jumping point for me for graphic novels and also serial killers. So it's kind of a secret no one knows, but I guess everyone knows now. Um, <laughs> I think serial killers are interesting. So anyways, um, Dirk Beck Durf um, originally started writing down his stories of Jeffrey Dahmer once news broke um, of everything that had happened in um, 91. He started kind of putting them together in his in his head, but he really started writing them down after his death in '94. Um, originally, it was a self-published 24-page comic book in 2002. He kind of pitched this idea to people, and they were like, "This is never going to work." Um, so he did a self-published version of it, and he could only afford 24 pages, and it instantly became a cult classic. Um, it was then nominated for um, a a, a a uh, really big graphic novel award. I can't remember what the name of it was. Um, it was referenced in other works and document um, documentaries that people wrote and did about Jeffrey Dahmer. And also it was translated into several languages and adapted into um, a one act play. Um, so it was like kind of a big deal, but he wasn't happy with it. So he went back and he wrote the, this version in one month um, and he really put a lot more time into it. He interviewed all of his classmates. He went back, read the FBI files, looked at all the interviews that Jeffrey Dahmer did and then put all of that together into this, this story. So um, it's, he, he says that while he's writing this, it's still so surreal for him even now to look back at it and like, the Jeffrey Dahmer that he went to school with versus the Jeffrey Dahmer that we all know. And one of the things he writes is, um, <clears throat> you know, it's a tragic tale and it's lost none of its emotional power after t so many years, but it's my belief that Dahmer didn't have to wind up a monster. You know, all these people say, oh, it was this, it was his childhood and he was, um, you know, he, he had this really bad upbringing and this, this bad life. And he said, you know, he, once he kills, he 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 said, my sympathy for him ends. Yes, he had a terrible life and there was a lot of demons, but he could have turned himself in. But he chose to become a serial killer and spread misery to countless people. There are a surprising number out there who view Jeffrey, Jeffrey Dahmer as some kind of anti-hero, a bullied kid who lashed out at the society that rejected him. And this is nonsense. Dahmer was a twisted wretch whose depravity was almost beyond comprehension. Pity him but don't empathize with him. And I thought that is really interesting that he wrote that and so very true, right? Like so many people are like, oh, he just lashed out, but it's, it, you can pity him, but don't empathize him like that. There's a difference between that. So his story, um, you know, at the beginning, he talks about Dahmer in elementary school and middle school and how he barely made a ripple, like he was just not really seen, but that all changed their sophomore year of high school. He said um, he started, um, doing things that kind of made focus on himself like he would have these epileptic like seizures like kind of mocking and these episodes that would call attention to him and he said that he was mocking the interior designer um that his mother had hired but you find out later that his mom who is an alcoholic and addicted to prescription drugs was having these episodes so there's like this parallel where like he's calling attention to himself but also kind of calling out his mom and maybe that's his way of kind of like dealing with the troubles that are going on at home um but you know the group that turf was in um they were a lowly you know band of nerds who were in the band and you know just stuck to each other so you know they kind of latched on to Dahmer and kind of thought like his antics were a funny thing and you know looking back now they're like it makes sense but at the time when you're in high school 
it could be worse. Like that, the, the, the slide that was just on the screen, you know, there was a guy who would just like yell out, you know, or do all these things and like pick fights with people. And, you know, so they were like, well, well, it's just, you know, it's no big deal. It could be worse. And so they kind of made this fan club. They called it the Dahmer fan club. And they kind of um, poked fun at him, but in a fun, you know, high school way that you do with your friend, you know, you bust their, bust their chops and you do this. And so they, they would put him in like random group photos that he didn't belong in and they would pay him to do that. And he went along with it. They had no idea that he had started drinking at like seven o'clock in the morning to start numbing his feelings about what was going on in his life. Um, the book goes through pretty much their whole high school relationship, how they interacted with him. And then also he kind of plugs in the facts that he's known from some of the interviews that, Dom that Dahmer's done. And he says in the book, these years that I'm talking about, Dahmer refers to it as one of his fondest years at school, like being uh, associated with this group and included is one of the happier times in his life. Um, but the book ends with Durf getting a phone call from his wife, who is a reporter, um, 13 years later in 91. Um, and she's like, you're never going to get that. You're never going to believe this. There's this guy in Wisconsin. He killed all these people. He kept them in, their, in his apartment. And he went to your high school. Can you guess who it is? And he says, Fig, which is the guy who has these outbursts that everyone thinks is kooky. And she's like, no, it's Dahmer. And he was like, oh my God, Dahmer, what have you done? And that's where the book ends. The other thing I love about this is that he goes back and he makes footnotes of all the historical facts. So you can read the graphic novel, but then you can go back and read the backstory of each, um, what do you call it? I can't think of each. What do you call the, squ the squares? Like the um, illustration or whatever. The, oh, the um, panel. Yes, panel. There it is. That's oh. what I was looking for. It tells the backstory and the research and the, the um, history of each panel, which that was extremely fascinating to me. So to, to read it and then to go back and read even more about it, it was like the whole book is just really, really interesting. It's not violent at all. You know, like there's a little bit of... Um, I was going to say, isn't there a situation where he ends up like killing a cat or something? Yeah, I mean, he talks, uh, there's nothing done to other people. Like, he right. doesn't murder, yeah. like, it ends it's with him that. planning yeah. his first murder and that jog, you know, the jogger. Um, yeah. They do reference, like, his sexuality, how that must have been hard growing up as a homosexual um, teenager, you know, um, and that his struggles and his demons, that and how he kind of dealt with that. But, yeah, they do make some reference to him, you know taking some of these animals and dissecting them and killing them and torturing them um, to kind of set, you know, what what what's going to happen. Right. So it, the book is so interesting. Serial killers are interesting. I have, I have, a, actually you suggested that I read this one and it is, it's super fascinating. The way that the author sets it up, the storyline, because he, yeah, like with him, he would go out like in the woods and he would like, I don't, I just remember the specific instance with like, but then mm -hmm. like it shows him doing that or like he went for like a drive, but then it shows him like back at school. And so you're seeing how he's like putting on this face at school, but at home things are just falling apart and you get that parallel. Okay. Because everyone happening. in high school, they didn't know. I mean, they just thought he was just like a, you know, kind of different quirky guy. And, you know, so like they had no idea of the other stuff that was going on at home. And there's even um, a scene where they come and pick Durf up to go to a party. And his mom is like totally blown out and prescription pills. And they're like, what's her deal? And he like, don't worry about it. And they get in the car and he, Dahmer immediately opens up beers and just starts hammering. Like the six pack is gone before they even get to the party. And at the time they were just like, oh, he's a party animal, whatever. But, you know, now you have those two sides, those, the story that Dahmer has told people about his private life and then Durf's story of being involved in his public, you know, like what he thought was public. So you have those two kind of stories parallel and it's, it's very, very fascinating. It brings up so many psychological things because you think about situations like that. And I wonder how many of his friends at the time were like, why didn't I see that? Why didn't I understand these warning signs? Like, why didn't we say like, hey, man, you're drinking a lot or like, hey, man, why are you drinking so early in the morning? Or, hey, you're like, do you always act kind of? But like, we're so afraid of offending people or getting mm -hmm. too much under their skin or, you know, things like that, that, you know, hindsight is 2020 in situations like that, I can imagine. Yeah, absolutely. It's crazy. Yeah.
but and, and like I said, it's it's just so interesting to read it and then think like, oh, you, he's got such a terrible home life. But again, he had the choice to stop or turn himself in and to end that, but he didn't. He just kept going. And so I think like that message that Durf says, you can pity him, but don't don't empathize. Don't don't show any empathy. You know, like yeah. it, I don't know. It's just very interesting. I don't have a good segue from that. You're welcome. <laughs> and we end on that note. <laughs> so, so, so thank you, Kelly. Um, it, I, and I think it won the Eisner Award is the uh, art yeah. award that it won. I think it won the Will Eisner Award. Well, uh, I don't I think this one did, but the one before that, I feel like it started with an R maybe. I don't know, but maybe not. I don't, I don't remember. Anyways, oh, it's award winning. So, so there you go. If you need your true crime fix, which I do like me a good true crime podcast, I still haven't picked this one up. I don't know. It just not quite there yet. I prefer my horror to be made up. I think anyone <laughs> within the library can probably remember the first time they've heard of this book and they heard of it from Kelly. Because <laughs> <laughs> there was, was a while, like, she was like, oh my God, I want to read this. But then they made a movie out of it, and that really made me mad. I still haven't watched the movie, so I don't know if it's any good, because those of you who know me know I hate movies that are, no, you know, books that are turned into movies. Like, I just has, angry. Um, the guy from Teen Beach Movie. I don't know who that is, but yeah, maybe. It was just a couple years. Like, I feel it's like a, it was like um, 2007. Oh, God, 2008. I can't think of his actual name. It's, it was also on Austin and Alley. He's a Disney Channel star, I believe, plays Dahmer. He might. I don't know. I haven't Dom seen it either. On the cover but it may change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Again, no good segue. Just going to go to my books. <laughs> just roll I'll right through it. Just, just going to share mine. All right. And the first one I'm going to talk about is the Lock and Key series by Joe Hill, illustrated by Gabriel, Gabriel Rodriguez. Um, and I stole this image because it has a segment of all six of the covers in the series and I just love these covers. I love Rodriguez's artwork. Um, so I happen to like the description that the book gives and it's a very quick blurb. So Lock and Key tells of Key House, an unlikely New England mansion with fantastic doors that transform all who dare to walk through them. Home to a hate-filled and relentless creature that will not rest until it forces open the most terrible door of them all. And moving into this key house with all of its strange doors and strange keys and this creature are the lock siblings. Tyler, Kinsey, and Bodie, and their mother, who have left their home where they were because their father was murdered. So they're coming to the key house, which is where their dad grew up, for a fresh start. And it's not going to be quite the start that they expected. I love the illustrations. Um, each of the keys, you can see the imagination and the thought that went into them. And there are, I don't know how many keys in the books. There, there's like 20, 25 keys. There's a lot. Um, just a few of them, the anywhere key, the ghost key, the harlequin key, my personal favorite, the teddy bear key, bum, 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 teddy bear key. And the illustrations are amazing and detailed. The head key, which is the only one I'm going to talk about because it's one of the central keys and I think you see it in the first book. The head key gets inserted into the base of your neck and then in the book, and I keep saying in the book because there is also a Netflix series now based on lock and key. The series is great. I happen to love the graphic novels better, um, but the series is also well done. But and then in the book, your whole head like flips open and you can peer down into someone's head. And that's what you see on the screen right now. You're looking at Bodhi's head. And so it has your imaginations and your wishes and it has memories and it has also things like your anger or your sanity or your love. And the really wild thing is that if you can figure out which one is your anger, 
you could just reach in there, pluck it out of your head and remove it entirely and not have access or experience that emotion again. Or if you want to get really wild, you can take it out of your head, hang on to it, use the head key in somebody else's head and then put your anger in their head. Imagine the possibilities that could happen with that. Um, I just think these illustrations are amazing. Um, you can see Tyler up there with that soldier figure behind him and the power and the warrior that he wishes to be. Um, it's, it's just, it's great art. It's a great story. You learn throughout the six books, you learn about um, the history of the house, why these keys exist. Um, there is an overarching explanation for it. Um, it's, it's just great. Uh, I think I mentioned this in the past. You know, if you need another thing, like Joe Hill is Stephen King's son. I think he's an amazing author in his own right. Um, I do want to emphasize um, the television series kind of veers, I would guess, towards PG-13 ish. Um, there's definitely violence in there. The graphic novels are really violent. Um, so, you know, if you're going to be giving these to your kid or your kid's interested in reading them because they've seen the series, just flip through it real quickly first and decide what is best for your child um, because you can see the artwork so you can kind of imagine if there's violence, it, it's it's going to be there in your face. Um, but fabulous storyline. Um, all the characters are really interesting as they're struggling with the loss of their dad and then being in this um, wild environment in this house. So lock and key, pick it up, two thumbs up. Uh, my other one is more of an experimental novel. It's called One Soul by Ray Fox. And I'm going to go to my screen that shows what it looks like. So each panel in the book represents the life of one person from a different period and place and time. So this first panel represents this young man um, like in the Middle Ages. You have one that appears to be in Egypt. You have one that is, you know, she's over here, probably like in Victorian France. Um, and this one um, is modern, fairly contemporary. And then so that you follow the lives of 18 different characters throughout the entire book. So when you turn the page, the next page is going to have the same 18 characters but they'll be doing something else. And then you turn the page, same 18 characters. They're always in the same place in the book and it follows them through their from birth all the way until they die. Um, and some of the characters live quite long lives. Some of them die prior to that, but you're on each page. They're all about the same age. I'm not explaining this very well, but I hope I'm at least giving you an idea of what Fox was trying to accomplish in creating this because you're following 18 different lives in different places around the world in different times in history. And yet there's something universal about that. Um, many of them struggle with how to feed themselves and how to provide for themselves. They struggle with finding love. They struggle with their parents. They struggle with illness. They struggle with dying. Um, it was just really interesting. And then the title of the book is One Soul. Um, so he really emphasizes as much as we are all different and how each of these characters is very different, there's also the something that ties us all together. And sometimes those are amazing and beautiful things. And sometimes those are the really hard things about living. I just thought it was something that you really couldn't do with the written word. You couldn't do that format with the written word. And I, I, I so I, yeah, I'm not explaining this well, but there you go. Re pick up one soul and you can read it two different ways. You can read it, you know, read each panel, turn the page, read each panel, turn the page and follow their lives that way, which is how it's intended. 
or if you find that a little overwhelming, you can just read the one panel, you know, in the upper left corner and just get through that person's whole life and then read the next one. Um, it's two thumbs up, Ray Fox. I just thought it was a really fascinating way to present an idea about what it means to be human and experience life in different ways. So there's mine. Graphic novels, there's something for everyone. So thank you to each of you. Pardon? I said that sounds fascinating, that setup. It, it really is, and it's a very quick read. You know, I think like so many of these, you're going to get it done in probably about an hour or two. So you're absorbing all of that, and then you can kind of sit with it, and particularly this one, you can sit with it and think about it. If it's lock and key, you're just going to go through and find out what happens next. And I think that's like the best thing about graphic novels is they are quick, but that doesn't mean that they don't, I think a lot of them, they stay with you because mm -hmm. not only do you have that story, but you have the images. Mm -hmm. And so like you're able to, like Jody was saying earlier, especially historical stuff, maybe I don't want to read a 300 page book about the Titanic, but I can read a you know graphic novel in half an hour and I've learned a ton of stuff and it stays with you. Anybody who thinks that graphic novels aren't like real books, shut up because they're amazing. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> just, just stop. stop but they like, really, you can get so, and there's, there's something truly for everyone. And graphic novels are, are not to be like, ignored. Yeah. Although I have to say, I forgot to mention this in Kristen's. Here's me running off on a rabbit trail. Um, you'll notice most of these are they were either available in print or they were available, you know, as an ebook. Kristen's Hey Kiddo was available as an audiobook. I just talked to somebody about this at Bedford. And that kind of blew my mind because I feel yes. like you're not getting the same yeah. experience. Like it would still be worthwhile because that story, his story is right. incredible, but it's not the same experience without the visual. Right. She. So I. that's so funny you brought that up because I literally just talked to somebody at work and she said, yeah, I just read a graphic novel and it was only available in audio until I could get the regular book, she said. So I checked it out. She said, and I was actually really excited about it because all of the characters, they had different people playing their voices and then anything that had any sound effects, they would play those sound effects in the background. That's cool. So yeah, I hadn't listened to that one, but I just thought that was really interesting. When I saw that, I was like, that up. How, how is that an audio book? So there is a way to experience graphic novels, some of them as an audio as well. So a little something for everyone. So thank you to each of you. Uh, thank you to those of you who listened. And next time we are, it, next week is Banned Books Week. So we are going to be sharing some of our favorite books that have been banned. So join us for that, and I hope you all have great weeks, and we'll see you next time. Bye.